there. Thank you very, very much. And um, if we could get if we could get our next speaker up, please. That's Amit from Accenture. This is where we need to be a little skillful now, this multitasking. So what Amit is going to talk to you about is, is the branding around open banking, the challenges that we, we face, and, and, and the future of, of open banking. And I can think of nobody better than Accenture to actually close the day with a real look at the future. So a, a visionary piece is what I'm hoping for. And I will, is that? Are you mic'd up yet? Okay. I'm mic'd up. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Good. Very high expectations have been set about this already. <laughs> so puts me in a more challenging position, but hopefully I'll be able to do some justice to this. Let's see if the tech works first. Sorry, I'm a consultant, so I go a bit blind without slides. So I'm really hoping that the slides come up very soon and we can start the session. I don't want to hold everybody back too late. Still working on the tech? Right. Oh, it'll be on that side. So what I'm going to do is uh, do a quick recap of what we have heard and seen in the last uh, two days. Uh, we are also going to talk through some of the key trends which we have observed internationally around open banking APIs and, and also talk a bit about what can we expect in the future, what are the developments we can expect in the next three, four years which will further strengthen this growing trend and, and make APIs mainstream, uh, not, not, not within our banking world but within our lives. It is happening today, don't get me wrong, but I think there are, there are more opportunities for us to uh, make this real, make this available and accessible to everybody. So quick recap of the last two days. We talked about uh, open banking strategy. We talked about, uh, uh, we talked about the brand purpose. We talked about moving away from traditional KPIs because traditional KPIs are not the real best real and the best measure of uh, how to value the benefit which APIs give all of us. We had speakers talking about uh, experimenting with commercialization models and how new organizations are commercializing this. There was a lot of conversation around ecosystems and the emphasis on developer experience. And I'll touch upon that point a bit more because I think this is mass totally underserved in the financial services industry. The financial services industry as a whole has not fully figured out the importance of managing developer experience and managing customers. We talked about lots of emerging use cases, especially around insurance and how insurance is following in the footsteps of banking. And we are entering a world of open insurance. We talked about how API open banking is spreading around the world. It's no longer a UK, European phenomena. There are 42 countries apparently around the world who are exploring legislation similar to what we have in UK. Uh, UK is the front runner, so everybody is watching us very closely and trying to learn, uh, learn from us. And, and finally, we talked about some of the risks and, and, and uh, standards which need to be in place, which I think are hygiene for, a, for, a, for API adoption to happen across, uh, across the industry. So that's a quick reca recap of what we have seen. And let's get into my presentation. So open banking, as we understand it, is I think still in its infancy. APIs have been available around for some time, but the concept of having open APIs, standardized APIs, which are accessible easily by multiple parties is still in its infancy. I mean, UK is the only market where open banking is live till to some extent over the last 18 years, uh, last 18 months. Uh, Europe is just live for live only for two months. Uh, and most of the other countries internationally are, are not yet, uh, have not yet gone live with the regulatory side of open banking. But having said that, it is very encouraging to see that there are organizations and banks and fintechs and even non-banks 
who are experimenting with open banking and APIs uh, in absence of any regulation. Uh, and uh, let's talk, is lock, talk a bit more about what we have learned internationally over the last 18 months. Uh, as expected, with APIs being available, uh, especially account information and payment, inform payment initiation APIs, uh, aggregation and personal finance management and business finance management was the most obvious proposition or product to launch. So this is how market understands the open banking brand. A lot of people think, in, think today that open banking is about account aggregation, PFM and BFM. Um, it's partially true. This was the most obvious use case coming out of open banking. Uh, I would say that based on the UK experience, account aggregation has met with a lukewarm reception from the consumer. There was a huge initial growth in the consumer numbers, and from what I am given to understand, there are possibly 1.2 million users of account aggregation uh, in the United Kingdom. But then that number has gone a bit flat over the last six months. Uh, customers want this, don't get me wrong. We have done surveys, and customers are willing to trade data if they are able to get reciprocal benefits. I think what has missed in the first phase of launch of account aggregation, PFM, BFM products, is the ability to provide deep personalization. I know my colleagues from Money Hub talked about personalization, and I think that is what is needed for the next level of account aggregation, which I'm hopeful will be launched into the market within the next six banks, next six months by both big banks and, and smaller financial organizations and fintechs. And then we would see this really take up. So we talked a bit about the retail customer and, and what they have got out of open banking, but the space where open banking and API adoption is growing rapidly is, is large corporates. Small and medium businesses today expect their bank to provide not only banking services and payment services. The expectation is a bit more today. Their expectation is, how can you help me to run my business better? The expectation is that the bank not only provides payment services, which they do very well, I want my banks to provide me accounting services. I want my bank to provide me business administration services, payroll services, uh, invoice reconciliation services. And that's where the market is moving, which is why we see the rise of players like Xero and QuickBooks who are bringing integrated accounting uh, in, in, into this space where they are connecting to banks through various channels, APIs, screen scraping, et cetera, and are able to actually integrate bank accounts with uh, existing ERP or accounting, accounting packages. Within the corporate space, we are seeing a huge growth in the rise of treasury APIs. Uh, I have interesting anecdote to share. Uh, a large bank once, a few months ago, went and spoke to a large tech giant and said, we want to do, we want to you know, be your bankers and run your transaction banking internationally. The tech giant asked the large bank, do you have treasury APIs? which we can connect to. The bank said no, and the tech giant said our policy is that we won't do business with anybody who doesn't have APIs. That is the reality of APIs in the corporate world. They are becoming very, very important, relevant, and you can see the amount of investments which are happening in this space. The pioneer in this space in the corporate world has been Citibank with their product called City Connect, and I'm given to understand that today, between five to 10% of Citibank's international uh, uh, corporate connectivity traffic passes through City Connect APIs, which are a suite of around 50 APIs to help corporate manage every aspect of their life and connect their, exist, connect their enterprise systems to the bank. And, and, and similarly, we are seeing the rise of, rise of platforms where banks like Commerce Bank in Europe, uh, in Germany, and Cobase, ING Cobase in, in Netherlands, building up integrated cash management platforms which are, I would call, and which I would call is an extension of the business financial management uh, aggregation uh, tools, which I talked about in the previous slide. So another interesting and growing trend. Next, developer portals. As you can see from this chart on the left-hand side, most banks are, have not really invested any amount of money in the space of developer portals. I mean, my point is that if APIs are so important and developer portals are your channel to the, into the API economy, why not invest, them, invest in them? 
most, there is a disproportionate investment when it comes to large financial services organizations and even smaller organizations in terms of how much they spent in traditional channels like web and mobile and how much has been spent on the developer portal channel to get the APIs right. And, and there are only a few banks out there who are doing it really well. Uh, the banks which I would like to call out are, are DBS uh, in, in Singapore and, and BBVA in Europe. Uh, DBS, according to me, is the gold standard today when it comes to banking APIs. Here is one large bank who has the most richest set of corporate APIs uh, or, or, or retail APIs available, published, well-documented through a developer portal. They're doing everything right, which is why they are kind of up there with, 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 with the best in class right now, and they're growing, uh, they're growing quite fast. They, within the last 18 months, they have published 300 plus APIs onto the developer portal, which is accessible by third parties. Uh, they have created 90 new FinTech partnerships, which are live into production uh, with live apps in the market. One of the reasons why they are successful is that they have been technologically agile but they have also solved the operating model behind it. I mean, it is easy to, to technically onboard a partner onto your developer portal and onto your, onto your ecosystem. But a lot of organizations have underestimated the, the operational complexity of doing so. I mean, those of you who work in, work in the FinTech segment would clearly understand that you go to a bank, even if they have a developer portal, you, you get yourself onboarded to their developer portal, but that doesn't solve your problem. You still have to pass other checks around finance, compliance, and risk, which might take up to six months. So these guys, these guys who are forward thinking have cracked that code around how to collaborate with FinTech. A traditional bank still takes six months to engage with a FinTech and you know, take them into production, into the market, uh, end to end. These guys have cracked it down to three and four weeks, which is a significant difference from the traditional thinking, which is why they are winning. The other, other players which I would like to call out in the, in the financial services space, space are the big, big payment platforms like Adyen and Stripe, and even the traditional uh, payment rails or payment infrastructure providers like Visa or MasterCard. They have very, very sophisticated developer portals and, and they have really understood the need and importance of collaboration with third parties and fintechs. Platforms and ecosystems are dominating in today's world. They're dominating because they have APIs. A lot of people say that disruption within financial services industry hasn't happened yet and you know, APIs haven't impacted us and I would say otherwise. The payment, entire payment industry today has been revolutionized by, by what I call as new age payment services providers with the likes of Adyen, Square, Klarna and Stripe. The top seven payment services providers have market cap of $350 billion today. And these companies didn't exist 10 years ago. Nobody had heard of them. And, and these companies have grown on the back of building solutions, products and services, which are API first. If you go to, if you go to Stripe's website, their website is the same as, a de as their developer portal. Now, how many companies can claim that? My website is the same as my developer portal. That's how API focused and API first these companies are. Banks are trying to follow suit. Banks like BBVA and DBS and Citibank have launched significant, have made significant investments in, in similar approaches and have tried to launch bank as a service. I did talk about Zero Sage and QuickBooks and, 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 that, and that logo of Do Business Beautiful is Zero's logo of you know, how they are going to, or Zero's vision of how they want to attract small and medium businesses uh, and, and, and do business with them. And then there are the tech giants who have really proliferated APIs. Uh, organizations like Alipay, Tencent, and Gojek, which is, uh, which is a similar organization, a ride-sharing service in, in the uh, Southeast Asian region, have really expanded their ecosystem through APIs. Uh, and, and they are a good example of you know, how you can do banking from non-banking channels. All of these players have significant banking capabilities within their, cha with, within their channels and none of them are bankers. I mean, all of you have heard that in China, it's quite popular that people use WeChat to transact uh, or do financial transactions like pay money, you know, check account balance, et cetera. And that's the reality of life in that part of the world and that's growing in popularity. So clearly disruption is happening and has happened 
in certain segments. The bigger question is, which segments do we see disruption to happen the most, especially within the various sub-lines uh, sub of businesses within the financial services? Uh, my, my prediction is that payments, it has happened. The next part of business which will be massively disrupted through open banking and APIs in the next two years is small and medium businesses. The trend which organizations like Xero and QuickBooks have started is gathering momentum. And we are seeing a whole raft of new players who are investing significantly into the space to capture that type of market share. And, and there are big banks who are reacting. There are very, very large banks who would launch propositions which go back into what I said earlier. Small and medium businesses want their banks to help them run their businesses, and big banks are going to, are, are, have plans in place and are going to launch propositions which not only do banking, but do accounting, business administration, payroll, taxation, everything through one platform. And that's what is going to help small and medium businesses and attract new customers to them, for them. A bit. Uh, the next trend which is quite interesting is what is the rise of marketplaces. Uh, a lot of you, few of you who are UK based would know what Starling Bank and number 26 have achieved in the market. Uh, I think some of these players, especially the challenger or the new banks have been big beneficiaries of the open banking revolution. They have been able to use open banking principles, open banking concepts to grow their business. If you, if you take the size of a challenger bank, 18 months ago, a challenger bank in Europe was 250,000 customers 18 months ago. Now, the fantastic four of the challenger banking world, Starling, Monzo, Number 26, and Revolut, each have anywhere between one to four million customers, and that's significant. One of the reasons why they have been able to grow business is through partnerships with fintechs, with third parties, and the partnerships have happened through APIs. I'm not saying that the entire reason for their growth is APIs. They have invested a lot in customer-centric design and, and user experience. But, but a lot of plumbing behind all of that nice user experience has happened because of availability of APIs and ability to partner with, with the right type of partners. And as you can see from this, this graph, these banks are doing a whole range of things you know, right from providing saving spots to currencies, to insurance, to managing investments, you know, providing credit score, and even, even working with bike sharing apps. So if you have a number 26 banking app, bank mobile app, you can actually get a line bike in London uh, and, and, and pay for it right out of your app. So they're doing a whole lot of things which are quite interesting from a customer and suddenly from a single product organization, they have become a full service bank. And I think that is one of the main reasons why they are growing rapidly. But banks are not keeping quiet. Large banks are reacting. So if neo banks are getting into financial marketplaces, large banks are looking at adjacent value chains and getting into non-financial marketplaces. It's not yet happened in UK, but it's a matter of time before we see a large bank start play in the non-financial services marketplace. Today, DBS in Singapore actually runs a car sales portal. This, they buy and sell new cars in the Singapore market, very similar to what Auto Trader does in UK. We would never think of a bank getting into that type of business. DBS is providing energy, energy switching, utility switching, just like what GoCompare and Compare the Market have been doing for us for ages. There is another bank in Singapore called UOB who have been providing travel services. Now you would ask me, that last part is quite interesting. You would ask me what, is, what does a bank have to do with travel services and where is the opportunity? So these guys figured out that they have a lot of customers who travel internationally and the only time a bank was able to understand that I have a client who has traveled internationally is when they saw the end of the month credit statement. That is when they realized that, oh, these guys have actually spent 10,000 Singaporean dollars in the last one month and I had no clue about it. I had no clue about what was it for. So they said, can we 
create better relationships with our, with our customers by you know, getting into their travel journey and helping them better. So they actually tied up with some leading travel API providers like Expedia and Agoda, and actually embedded Expedia into the banking website so that people can buy travel at the best market rates which the leading providers provide, but bundled with the travelers international cards, foreign exchange, insurance, and, and, and tax refunds, because Singaporeans apparently like to shop a lot. Now that creates a differentiated, differentiated journey as is, and is creating new stickiness between them and their customers. Of course, all of these are very early days. These have been launched in the last three or four months, but clearly I see this as a big trend where banks and incumbents will start getting into non-financial services space use APIs to bring non-financial products within their domain and try to create stronger and stickier customer relationships. Partnerships. Partnerships are key and, and one of the biggest beneficiaries of, of this have been neobanks and fintechs. If you look at all of the neobanks or challenger banks in, in UK and Europe, they have significant fintech relationships. They have cracked that collaboration code, they understand it. I'm quite hopeful that some of the larger incumbent banks in the next few years will, will understand the significance of it and will have the right operating model and governance in place to rapidly build new partnerships because that is key here. If open banking has to grow, partnerships have to, be, have to evolve and mature rapidly so that everybody within the ecosystem benefits and starts making money. Lastly, open banking is not about banks. We have heard a lot of discussions around how other sectors are, are following similar models. Every other sector is closely looking at banking industry and trying to understand how can they benefit from this rich set of banking data which is available today through all of the APIs which legislation has given us. Insurers are trying to think, can I read a customer's transactions and create customized products? Can I reduce fraud through, of my, for my customers? The auto industry is very interested in understanding if they can significantly improve the auto finance process. And most of the large car manufacturers today are in pilots with a lot of fintechs to provide real-time credit, credit and real-time loans to customers within, within, within the car dealerships. Retailers are using open banking data to understand customer buying preferences uh, and, and, and reduce also, also use payment APIs to reduce the cost of their online payments by bypassing uh, the card networks. Telecoms are creating richer data sets by, by combining customer transaction data with the geolocation geo data which they have and trying to create new sources of monetization for anybody who needs this type of data. And, and, and there are other industries who are looking at open banking very closely to see uh, how how they could benefit from this. I think a point worth mentioning here around other industries getting into this space is around the Australian model. For, for those, are, those of you who are familiar with the Australian model, it's, it's called CDR. Uh, and it is about, it is not about banking, it's a cross industry model where banks are going to expose APIs in the first phase. Then it is going to be followed by utilities, retailers and telcos. Uh, which, is, which is quite interesting because the Australian vision is that by 2025, most of the major industries within that region will be operating with APIs at scale. I think the rest of the world is looking at it very closely because if that succeeds, we can expect similar legislation in our markets here. And that will accelerate that trend where other industries till that point would have been only consuming banking APIs, but they would also start producing APIs which the bankers in this room can start thinking about consuming. And that will lead to new journeys, new propositions. I don't know what that will lead into, but that will lead into something interesting, that's for sure, because there'll be a lot of data out there. Um, a closing remark from my, my side. 
we have been dealing with uh, open banking internationally over the last uh, two years. And if you, think of, if you think of why is the industry, why are regulators focusing and investing on open banking, I think the objective in different markets has been different. UK and Europe introduced open banking to increase transparency in the financial markets and increase improve competition. Hong Kong and Singapore actually used introduced open banking because they wanted their banking industry to be innovative and, and best in class internationally. There are other geographies which, which are coming up right now where open banking legislation is getting passed. Their focus around open banking is financial inclusion. Their belief is that in my, in my and I have met regulators in, in South Africa, in Thailand, in Mexico, we have people, we have more people who have mobile phones and smartphones with connections and we have less people who, are, who have a bank account. Can we, use open, can we use this as an opportunity to create financial inclusion in those markets? Even, even, even in Europe, we are looking at open banking as a tool to see how we can help open banking to support the financially squeezed. There are lots of organizations, including a project started by Nationwide, which is called Open Banking for Good, which focuses especially around that segment within the UK market and see how, we ca how can we use open banking principles to actually help, help the financially squeezed. Uh, again, thank you very much for being patient and hearing me through. Uh, hopefully it was useful. I hope I'm on time. Before um, you go, please, um, that was an amazing way to wrap up um, what has been a brilliant afternoon. Um, absolutely incredible. Loved what you said about Singapore. Um, probably like a lot of you, I've got friends that are out in the FinTech Festival out there. It is actually amazing what the regulator has put out, uh, put, put, put on, sorry, in Singapore to stimulate the market. So I think Singapore is definitely a market to watch. Has anybody got any questions for Amit, please? Thank you. Can we get a mic up there? Thank you. Can you give your name and your company? So give yourself a little bit of a name check. All right, hi there. My name is uh, Kun, and uh, I have a Belgian company called Cloudoki. I have a very simple question, but probably a hard answer. Um, with all those um, uh, petabytes of data flowing around in an open banking concept, in your perspective, or, or in the perspective of, of Accenture, who is actually the owner of the data? Is it the user, or is it the bank? I think it is, it is a multi-layered question, but uh, if, I, if I take a simplistic view of it, I think GDPR says that any, any, any data which you hold in an in a, in a organization or an enterprise is a customer data. And, and I would say that the customer would have to have the ownership of that data. This is, not a, this is a problem which we need to solve in the world of open banking. This is not easily fixed. Uh, again, I go back to the Australian example. The Australian example. So, if you think of how we did open banking in Europe, in Europe, we created PSD2 first, and then we said, okay, GD it has G it has implications with GDPR, and then you know consent and all of that came in. Australia did it exactly the other way around. They created the data model first, put consent around it, and then said, okay, let's put open banking into it. I th I, I, I'm a big fan of the Australian model. I've spent some time time in that geography over the last six months, and and. Uh, the answer is yes, the customer has to own it, but I don't think across the industries we have the right level of infrastructure to manage it. There are too many gaps and holes in that, in, on, the, in, on that account. I'm, I'm curious, whilst we've got a guru on stage, do you think the Australian model has benefited by looking over the shoulder at the blueprint that we've created in the UK? Every, I, I, think, I think everybody has benefited. Everybody looks at UK very closely. The reason I spent time in Australia is the Australian banks and the regulators want to understand you know, what went wrong in UK, or what could we do better. And I'm, I'm a big fan of you know, what we have done in UK. I think it is one of the best API standards and, and has huge amount of clarity in terms of what the regulator has done. There are things which regulator missed in the first, first iteration, but they have clearly corrected it. Uh, but then there, are other evolution, there is evolution happening in other markets from which we can learn. I mean, I mean a good, another good example is New Zealand. New Zealand is only one of the, one of the open banking, uh, I would say, jurisdictions where 
non-banking organizations and large non-banking organizations have a seat at the table. It's not like in UK where the large banks have a seat at the table and fintechs have some seat. In New Zealand, large banks, a huge non-banking player and fintechs have equal seat at the table. That's a difference when it comes to policy making. You get a different outcome. Before um, Amit goes, has anybody got any more questions? Right, we have had an absolute masterclass. Ladies and gentlemen, will you really put your hands together for our last speaker of today, Amit from Accenture. Thank you. Thank you.